Good morning. <laughs> it's, uh, it's awesome to be here. I uh, appreciate you guys in, inviting me over and uh, allowing me to speak uh, to you. Again, I'm, I'm fairly new at this. Uh, I, like, like I just said, we started in uh, Woodland Park just at the end of October, basically, of last year. So we're, uh, we're in new of it, but I, I've grown up in the church. My father's uh, a preacher, and he recently moved down to Texas, so don't hold that against him or anything. But uh, uh, <laughs> we're, uh, we're going to study God's Word this morning, and hopefully uh, we can get something out of it uh, uh, together. Uh, when I was asked to do, uh, to do this, I was given the topic of a... Uh, a renewed and willing uh, spirit, and Psalm 51 was uh, the text that was given to me, and if you know anything about uh, Psalm 51, uh, David wrote this psalm right after he was confronted by uh, Nathan the prophet. He had sinned, uh, he had, had done some horrible things, and he wrote this uh, Psalm 51, of, and we have a song that we sing, Create in me a clean heart, O God. It's in this uh, uh, in this psalm, and it's uh, it's a it's a man that is completely uh, broken. He knows that he has sinned against God. He is he's done horrible things, and he is asking God to clean me. Is what uh, uh, David is saying. And so uh, we understand, and we and we read the story of, of David committing adultery and murder. By, by proxy, and, and God brought terrible and, and just, we could call it just judgment upon him because of his, his sinful behavior. But then later in Acts chapter 13, we read that David is a man after God's own heart. Well, what happened? What changed uh, in David? How can that be? How can this uh, adultery, murderous individual be a man after God's own heart? Uh, let's flip over and remind ourselves of the story in uh, 2 Samuel uh, chapter 11, if you don't mind flipping over there real quick. <clears throat> and we'll just read uh, together 2 Samuel 11, uh, starting in verse 1, and just remind ourselves of what David did uh, and his uh, sinful behavior there. So, then it happened that in the spring, at the time when the kings go out to battle, that David sent Joab and all of his servants with him and all of Israel, and they destroyed the sons of Ammon and besieged Rabbah. But David stayed in Jerusalem. And now when the evening came, David arose from his bed and walked around on the roof of the king's house, and from the roof he saw a woman bathing. And the woman was very beautiful in appearance. So David sent and inquired about the woman, and one said, it is, This is not Bathsheba, the daughter of uh, Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite. And David sent messengers and took her. And when she came to him, he lay with her, and when she had purified herself from her uncleanliness, she returned to her house. And the woman conceived, and she sent and told David and said, I am pregnant. Then David said to Joab, saying, Send me Uriah the Hittite. So Joab sent Uriah to uh, David, and when Uriah came to him, David asked concerning the welfare of Joab and the people in the state of the war. Then David said to Uriah, Go down to your house and wash your feet. And Uriah went out of the king's house and uh, and the present from the king was sent after him. But Uriah slept at the door of the king's house with all the servants of his lord, and he did not go down to his house. Now when they had told David, saying, Uriah did not go down to his house, David said to Uriah, Have you not uh, come from a long journey? When do you, <clears throat> why did you not go down to your house? And Uriah said to David, uh, The ark and Israel and Judea are staying in temporary shelters, and my lord Joab and the servants of my lord are camping in the open field. Shall I then go to my house to eat and drink and lie with my wife? By your life and the life of your soul, I will not do this thing. Then David said to Uriah, Stay here today also, and tomorrow I will let you go. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day and the next. And now David called him, and he ate and drank before him and made him drunk. In the evening he went out and lied in his bed with the Lord's servants, but he did not go down to his house. Now it came about that in the morning when David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah, and he had written the letter saying, Place Uriah in the front line of the, for, of the fiercest battle, withdraw from him, so that he may be struck down and die. So, we understand, you know, when things, uh, when things go wrong in, in, in our lives, uh, many Christians will say, 
don't live with regret. Everything happens for uh, a reason. You know, in other words, everything happens that has been uh, brought on by uh, God. You know, it's going to be it's going to be okay. And in fact, someone carried this uh, sentiment a little bit uh, further, and they said, "Everything happens for a reason. Just believe." Uh, and I, you know, I appreciate these. I appreciate these thoughts. And but my take on on scripture is just slightly different. I tend to think that everything happens for a reason. Sometimes the reason is you're stupid and you make bad decisions. <laughs> these are the reasons uh, that these bad things are happening. And this is kind of what's happening in the story we just read uh, uh, this morning. Uh, David's been uh, pretty pretty dumb. I mean, he's made some uh, dumb mistakes uh, in his uh, life, some bad decisions here. And before we get to really in depth in this part of the story, you know, let's let's recap and remind ourselves of what uh, David has been through up until uh, this point. You know, we we're first introduced to David. He's a young shepherd boy. He's uh, taking care of his father's sheep, and David loves God. He loves him so uh, much that he spends all of his time out in the fields uh, thinking about God. He's writing songs about God, and he's uh, meditating on God's law all the time. This is this is the character of uh, of David, and David loves God so much, and he can't imagine a day that he isn't praying or meditating or uh, being in God's presence. This is David as a, as a young uh, a child, and he's, it's, it's, he's a fantastic example. And that's what he's doing. He's singing and praising and, and meditating in the fields when God sends the prophet Samuel uh, uh, to him to find him, and he's going to replace Saul with uh, David as the next king of Israel, Saul, you know, had once been this, had been a fairly uh, decent king, uh, but he had ultimately fallen into uh, pride and disobedience, and to the point where God told him that he would lose his throne to another man, uh, and this other man is going to be uh, David. Right after we, we see David being anointed, we find David taking uh, food to his, his brothers in the uh, on the battlefront, remember Israel's at war with the Philistines. David reaches the camp. There's a huge giant there. Uh, we, it's a story we tell our children all the time, David and Goliath. Uh, and Goliath is standing in front of uh, the armies of Israel, and he's insulting them, and he's insulting God, and he is, he's a foul uh, you know, individual there. And David is uh, incensed. You know, he's, he's sitting there going, who is foolish enough to insult God? Who? And David goes, with God on my side, I will uh, take him out. And, and David brings the giant down, and he starts his career as this mighty warrior uh, for God and Israel. And he's successful, and people start singing his praises. And his uh, popularity causes uh, King Saul to become uh, jealous of him and several times Saul seeks to kill uh, David, but eventually, you know, Saul dies in in battle, and David is now uh, king. And for the next twenty years or so, David is uh, a great king of Israel, and he leads uh, the armies of Israel in victory over many enemies. And then it brings us to our story today. Now, David, at this point, he's in his uh, 60s, probably, and we're told that it's the spring of the year. It's the time when the kings often are, are supposed to go out on the battlefield, and they're supposed to be at war, we're told. And David is not on the battlefield. Where is David? Well, David stayed home. David is staying at home. This is the time when the kings were supposed to be in the battle, why did David stay home? Well, we read, you know, there's this, there's a lady. She lives next door. <laughs> uh, she's uh, the wife of one of David's most trusted uh, warriors and friends. You know, Uriah's part of this elite fighting force known as David's 30 mighty men, uh, Uriah. And his, his wife's name is 
Bathsheba. And I, I, I believe that uh, David had uh, seen her on the roof uh, before. Uh, and I think she had, uh, and he had, he had witnessed her uh, take baths a few times in the past. You know, she's, she's now nude on, on the roof. He's standing there and he uh, finds himself attracted to him. And she uh, is attracted to uh, him as well. And, and husband's out of town. David obviously likes how she looks. Uh, she's young. She's, pu- she's beautiful. And you, you see this scene playing out. And if this scene had played out in any of our you know, television shows that we watch today, you know, you find yourself rooting for them to get together. It's like these two, they should be together. They're, 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 they're meant for each other. There's, there's desire in his eyes and desire in her eyes. And uh, they are meant to go together. And, and there's this, you know, the old song, you know, if... If loving you is wrong, I don't want to be right. You know, it's playing in the background, and they're they're going to get together. They're it's meant to be. And after all, you know, who's it going to hurt? Rise out of town? No one's going to know. Let's do it. Well, there's a small complication that arises because of their uh, incident together. She gets pregnant. Women who were uh, married and got pregnant by another man at this time had a major problem. And they, their punishment was they had to be stoned to death. This is a serious situation that Bathsheba is now put into. You know, I understand that David probably could have pulled some strings on behalf of Bathsheba, got her out of that um, Punishment saved her on life. You know, after all, he is the king. Uh, but even if he accomplished that, it would ruin her uh, reputation. And of course, it's not going to really do any good for his reputation either. He's the king, and ugh, this is not going to be a, a pretty situation. So they start to do the math. They're doing this uh, clever game, and they realize that if they wait for Uriah to get home from war, Everybody's going to know that Uriah is not the father. They understand this. And so David pulls some strings, gets Uriah to come home on a furlough, and hopes that Uriah will go and sleep with his wife, and that he'll think that this child is his child. Now, great plan. They're going to get away with it. This is a perfect plan. But Uriah, he's an honorable man. (laughs) He... He's a decent man. He, he comes home. He refuses to go and sleep with his wife. And when David asks him why he won't do that, he replies in uh, 2 Samuel eleven eleven, The ark and the Israel and Judea are staying in tents, and my master Joab and my Lord's men are camped in the open fields. How could I go to my house and eat, drink, and lie with my wife? As sure as you live, I will not do such a thing. So you, we, we see that Uriah has some some character. He's a he's a good man. So David is now uh, in panic mode. <laughs> now he's got to think of something else to do. Uriah's not going to fall for their little uh, scheme, so he's got to come up with something else uh, to fix the problem. He he can't cover up his sin, and he's he's run out of options. So he decides that he's got to get rid of Uriah. You gotta get rid of him. So David signs Uriah's death warrant and then has Uriah himself deliver it to the general Joab in the field. And, you know, Joab's also David's nephew there. So the order says that you know Uriah is to be sent into the heat of the battle. As the battle becomes intense, Joab is, is to withdraw all the other. Uh, soldiers and allow Uriah to face the enemy alone. And that's what happens. Uriah dies in the battlefield. Now that Uriah's dead, Bathsheba's a, a free woman. And David takes her as his wife and everything's right in the world. Perfect. Perfect plan executed. <laughs> 
They're safe. Nobody but Bathsheba and David and Joab know anything happened at all. And everybody's going to keep their mouth shut, and we're going to go right on with our lives and like nothing ever happened, right? This is what David is thinking. Unfortunately for David, there is somebody else that knows what's going on here. And David should know who that person is. It's God. And because David wrote in Psalm 139, starting in verse 7, he says, Where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If, if I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me and the light about me night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is bright as the day, for the darkness is as light with you. So David, David understood uh, God's omnipresent presence and omniscience and all of his uh, super abilities to understand everything that goes on in all of our lives, no matter how far away uh, you can put it, you cannot hide from God. And David understood that principle, and yet he is still trying to hide from God. Now, confession, I, you know, there's been times in, in my life where you know, I've remembered sins that, that, that I have done, and, and maybe you're similar to me, where you, you think back of something that you did, some sinful behavior, and you're uh, ashamed of yourself and what you have done, something you have said, something you have uh, thought, uh, something you've done. And, you know, I think to myself, you know, I don't want to uh, confess this sin to God. I don't want to tell God about this, these, these thoughts that I'm having, because if I confess this sin to God, then God's going to know about it. <laughs> and I get in that, that mindset of, if I just don't tell him, he's not going to know about it. Well, that's, that's just dumb. <laughs> we think like that, and where we're trying to hide our sins from God, you can't hide it. God knows about it, regardless if you tell him or not. <laughs> and he is everywhere. He knows everything. And, and God had known and knew what David had done. And he gets one of the most <coughs> scathing uh, rebukes as you can find in Scripture. God sends uh, the prophet Nathan to him, and he tells him this, uh, this parable. And if you want to, let's flip over and, and read it. It's in 2 Samuel chapter 12, and we'll, we'll read this and uh, <clears throat> listen to the rebuke here at the, at the end. So, starting at verse 1, Then the Lord sent Nathan to David, and he came to him and said, There were two men in one city, and one rich and the other poor. And the rich man had great many flocks and herds. But the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb, which he brought, which he bought and nourished. And it grew up together with him as his children. And he would eat of his bread and drink of his cup and lie in his bosom, and it was like a daughter to him. And now the traveler came, the rich man, and he was unwilling to take from his own flock or his own herd to prepare for the wayfarer who had come to him. Rather, he took the poor man's ewe lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him. Then David's anger burned greatly against the man, and he said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, surely the man who has done this deserves to die. And he must be uh, make restitution for the lamb fourfold, because he did this thing, and he has no compassion. And David then said, or Nathan said to David, You are the man. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, It is I who anointed you king over Israel, and it is I who delivered you from the hand of Saul, I also gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your care, and I gave you the house of Israel and Judea. And if I had been too little, I would have added to you many more things like these. Why have you despised the word of the Lord by doing evil in his sight? You have struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword and have taken his wife to be your wife. You have killed him with the sword of the sons of Ammon. Now, therefore, the sword shall never depart from your house because you have despised me and have taken the wife Uriah. Uh, the Hittite to be your wife. 
Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will raise up evil against you from your own household. I will take your wives before your eyes and give them to your companion. He shall lie with your wives in broad daylight. Indeed, indeed you did it secretly, but I will do this thing before Israel as and under the sun. Then David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, The Lord has also taken away your sin, and you shall not die. However, because by this deed you have given occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme, the child also that is born to you shall surely die. So Nathan went into his house. So we get this parable that uh, Nathan speaks to him, and it's this parable that uh, is designed for the listener of the parable to uh, condemn himself uh, with un unbeknownst to him. <laughs> and in doing so, David realizes his sin, his mistakes, and he is rebuked by Nathan the prophet, rebuked by uh, God, and God is angry at <coughs> David. And he is furious and I don't recommend making God angry. It's not a, it's not a good position to be on that side of uh, that anger, for sure. But as you read along, back to read more into the, into the book here of 2 Samuel, you realize that everything that God has predicted here, God brought to pass. God brought judgment down upon David because what he had done is evil, wicked beyond understanding, and God was going to bring serious punishment to David's life. And that's what we expect from, from God. God is a righteous God. He punishes sin. We understand uh, this mentality, and this, this is what God does. He cannot abide sin. We must stamp it out uh, from our lives. But then, later, fast forward to Acts chapter 13, in verse 22, Luke writes, God raised up for Israel David as king, to whom also he gave testimony and said, I have found David the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, who will do all of my will. We just read some horrible things about David. And the punishment that he's getting from God, and this, this doesn't make any sense. David commits terrible sins in his life, and now God says that he is a model for righteousness. What, where did that come from? I mean, that seems like out of the blue. Well, if you go through and you, and you study your uh, Old Testament and you're, you're reading through, uh, it's pretty clear. Uh, after... David dies in, uh, in the Old Testament here. We read his name all throughout uh, the Old Testament where, where God is honoring David. In 1 Kings 15, verse 11, we read that King Asa did what was right in the eyes of the Lord as David, his father, has done. Then God says the same thing about King Hezekiah. In 2 Kings 18, 3, King Hezekiah did what was right in the eyes of the Lord according to all that David, his father, had done. And in fact, this kind of, kind of thing is said about several of the good kings of uh, Judea. In fact, at one point, God describes himself as being the Lord, the God of David, in 2 Chronicles 21. And of course, here in Acts, David is described as a man after God's own heart. Hmm. So, what's going on here? What, is, what has happened? How could... David go from being a man condemned by God and scathed by this prophet here and all this sinful behavior to being this model of righteousness. Well, the something that happened was this. Something changed. What changed? David changed. And we read about this in Psalm 51. And Psalm 51 is described as a psalm of David when Nathan the prophet went to him after he had gone into Bathsheba. And in this psalm, 
David pleads, have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my sin and my transgressions, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, cleanse me from my sin, for I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean, wash me and I shall be whiter than snow, let me Hear joy and gladness, gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all of my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with your willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your way and sinners will return to you. It's a beautiful psalm, and you can, you can feel the pain in, in David's voice. You can, he's not, he knows that he has wronged not only Bathsheba, not only Uriah, everybody else who was involved, but he has angered God with his sin, and he is begging God to clean, clean me. Don't cast me out of your presence, Lord. Change me, create in me a clean heart, O oh God. And, and David has repented of his sins, and God forgave him. There's a famous passage in 2 Peter 3 9 that tells us that God is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. And the Bible tells us that when we repent, God forgives our sins. It says that he buries the sins in the depths of the sea. It's like he's putting up a sign saying, no fishing. <laughs> Buried in there and you're gone. And it also says that he removes his, our sins as far as, from the, as the east is from the west. And that's an interesting uh, a phrase, east is from the west, and uh, why doesn't it say that he removes our sin as far as from the north is from the south? Well, if I were to leave here this morning and walk north and keep going north until I reach the North Pole, I would get to the North Pole and everything would be south of me. The same is true if I walked south and walked all the way to the South Pole. Once I reached it, everything would be north of me. There would be a finite amount of north and a finite amount of south. But if I start walking west, how far do I have to walk until I'm not going west anymore? <laughs> Forever. It never ends. You can keep going around and around and around west, and the same is east. Keep walking east. This is what God is saying there is no limit to the amount of forgiveness that God uh, will give. And it's a, it's, it's a comforting and a blessing, uh, but uh, it's also uh, humbling uh, to, to think about this and say, oh, I am a, I'm a sinful and I'm a horrible individual and I need that forgiveness and, but God is right there waiting uh, for you to, to ask for it. And it's, it's a beautiful uh, a system that God has established. And there's a, there's a story in the, in the New Testament about a man who received this kind of forgiveness as far as the east is from the west. And this, it, we know him as the Apostle Paul. And Paul wrote to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 1, starting at 15, he said, The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. He was the worst of all sinners, he says. But I received mercy for this reason, that in me, as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who, or to believe in him for eternal life. Now why would Paul believe that he is the worst of all sinners? Well, 
the advent. He was a horrible individual. <laughs> uh, year, years before Paul, he was known as Saul then, he hated Jesus. He persecuted Christians. He was partly responsible for the death of uh, Stephen, one of the first uh, uh, deacons in the church and first martyr for the faith there. And he was, people were terrified of him. He would drag Christians out of their homes into the streets. He would take them to prison. Uh, people would run screaming uh, from this individual. He hated Jesus. And from the day of his part in uh, Stephen's death, Saul made it his personal uh, mission to destroy the church. He was punishing, imprisoning, and he perhaps was even executing Christians for their faith. He was a sinner, horrible uh, individual. Jesus met him, though, on the road to Damascus. And Saul changed. He from the moment of his baptism into Christ, uh, you, you couldn't stop him from speaking. You couldn't shut him up. They tried to make him stop speaking. He would not do it. Uh, and he, his, he repeated his message that you are sinners, you deserve hell, and Jesus is the only way of your forgiveness of those sins. And this message began with the truth that he knew about himself. Uh, he had been the worst of all the sinners, and yet Jesus forgave him. There's a uh, story of a, of a man that had lived in England, and he had been a very successful uh, preacher, I guess you could say, and but over the time he had, he had lost interest in his in his faith and uh, he had drifted off into what we consider a, a secret uh, sin and he thought he had you know covered his tracks well but his, ultimately his secret sin became this uh, public knowledge as most secret sin usually does <laughs> and. He had lost, he had made headlines, and he lost his uh, pulpit job, and he had to move away because of the shame of uh, the, the sinful behavior that he's in. And uh, over time, he began to realize how uh, foolish he had been, and, became, and he came back to God uh, and in repentance. And in the town where he had moved to, where he chose to live, there was a church that, that needed, a, needed a preacher, and... Uh, they had heard him speak a couple times about his faith and asked him to uh, preach uh, for them. And he agreed, and he didn't tell anybody at this uh, new church about what he had done in his past. And as the church grew, crowds began to come in and, and pack the uh, auditorium. Uh, one day, though, he was getting ready to go up and, and preach, and a man handed him an uh, anonymous uh, note. And... In the letter was this complete description of the sin that he had committed. And there were words at the bottom of the page that said, I know about the sin that you've committed, and you have the audacity to go up and preach in the pulpit. And he said, I will publicly tell everyone about your past in the note. And he took this letter, and he began to, to weep. He was praying to God. A few minutes later, he was there in the pulpit, and he uh, began his message, and he read the letter in all of its detail. And then he said, I want to make this clear that the letter is perfectly true. And he says, I'm ashamed of what I've read and what I've done, and I've come tonight not as one who is perfect, but one who is forgiven. And from that day forward, God used that message to bring even more individuals to Christ. And there's this idea, there's, there's a lot of individuals that struggle with the idea of, uh, of forgiveness. Uh, they don't 
think that God could ever forgive them of the things that they've done and they try as hard as they can do and do as much as they can in hopes that God will you know, overlook their sins and, and love them again. But understand that it doesn't work this way. You cannot be good enough to be good enough. <laughs> uh, but you can be uh, repentant enough to be forgiven. And so the stories that we read, especially in the Old Testament, of God forgiving David and God uh, forgiving Paul, uh, he can and he will uh, forgive you. And we have this uh, theme that we have here of, of this ready and, and renewing and this Clean heart, O oh God, as he says in uh, Psalm 51, and it's a, a beautiful uh, sentiment. Now, uh, flip over to Second Peter real quick, and there's a uh, blessing in here as well that I wanted to look at. <clears throat> This uh, 2 Peter chapter 3. So, uh, Peter is writing uh, this book and he is uh, encouraging growth uh, in, in the church and that we have these Christian virtues that we hold fast to. These, these ideas of moral excellence and knowledge and self-control and perseverance and godliness brotherly kindness, love, these qualities we find in the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, because of the many eyewitnesses that we have of this gospel message, there is uh, a truth to, to be had in here. But then he goes into chapter 2 and starts talking about the, the rise and the fall of these uh, false prophets. Beware of false teachers, the false teachers that come and try to uh, pull you away from the truth. And then he goes into chapter 3 and is reminding them that there is a day coming. It's a great day that's coming for those of us that are in the Lord, but there is a day that is coming. And let's, let's just read chapter 3 together and then talk about it a little bit. He says, this is now, beloved, the second letter I'm writing to you in which I'm stirring up your sincere mind by a way of reminder that you should remember the words spoken beforehand by the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and your Savior spoken by your apostles. <clears throat> Knowing this, first of all, that in the last days mockers will come with their mocking, following after their own lusts, and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all continues just as it was from the beginning of creation. And when they maintain this, it escapes their notice that the word of God in heavens, listen, or heavens existed long ago, and the earth was formed out of water and by water, through which the world was destroyed, being flooded with water. But the present heavens and earth by its word are being reserved by, for by fire, keeping for the day of judgment and the destruction of ungodly men. But do not let this one fact escape your notice, beloved, that the Lord one day is a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing anyone to perish, but for all to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, in which the heavens will pass away, with the roar of the elements will be destroyed with intense heat, and the earth and all of its works will be burnt up. Since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought you be? in holy conduct and godliness, looking for a hastening of the coming of the day of God and account of which the heavens will be destroyed by burning and the elements will melt with intense heat. But according to his promise, we are looking for a new heaven and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, since you, uh, <clears throat> since you look for these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace, spotless and blameless, and regard the patience of the Lord to be salvation. Just as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom was given to you, wrote to you, and also in his letters speaking to them of these things, which are some things are hard to understand, which the untaught and unstable distort, as they do all the rest of the scriptures to their own destructions. You therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, be on guard, 
lest being carried away by the error of unprincipled men, you fall from your own steadfastness, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory, both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. So, Peter writing this, reminding us that there is a day coming. And for those of us that are in Christ, it's a glorious day, a day of rejoicing that is coming. But for those that are out of Christ, those that are still living in sin, it's going to be terrifying. Uh, something that I don't wish on anybody to have to go through in that, in that amount of terror. But this, this type of thinking, how we understand the day of the Lord is coming, we understand the judgment of God, we understand that He cannot abide sin, we understand that we need to make that uh, change in our hearts, that repentance in, in us, it guides us to live godly lives. This is uh, the perfection of the gospel. There is a way that we ought to live to please God, and the gospel guides us in that way, so we don't have to live in fear of this day, but we, we understand that our sin, and even if we are as sinful as David, or as sinful as Paul, we can have that renewal and have a, a ready spirit of change and repentance to him. That is uh, all I had for you this morning for class. There is, uh, this will tie into my lesson this morning uh, for the sermon, and in Romans chapter 12 of this being transformed and being uh, changed uh, by the gospel and having this uh, creating in me a clean heart, O oh God. So I, I appreciate your uh, attention this morning, uh, and we'll... We'll close here and then uh, be ready for uh, worship here in a few. Uh, do we close with a prayer or? Sure. Okay. <laughs> I'll go ahead and close this with a prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we uh, come to you this morning grateful for this opportunity. We can gather together as saints here and to study your word and be encouraged by each other's uh, company. We know that you offer uh, forgiveness. We know that we are sinners. We know that we need that forgiveness. We pray this morning that you grant us the forgiveness that we, we need and that we can live lives that are holy in your eyes. Thank you for the examples that you've set before us in your scripture. Help us to always be uh, desire to want to be in those scriptures to learn from them. We pray these things this morning in Jesus' name.